I'm Nina Curley here from WAMDA, uh, here at the pavilion with Dan Stewart, the former CEO and founder of Go Nabbit, and now the managing director for the Middle East of Living Social. Dan, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. So, Dan, I just want to know, since the acquisition this year um, by Living Social, how has your culture changed? Have you been able to preserve the culture you had at Go Nabbit? What's different internally, externally? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was one of the things that... One of the things we thought about even like going through the transaction process and even like considering, you know, who we wanted to be the new custodian of our business essentially, right? Because I mean like staff are involved obviously, so and we're involved and I need to say within the business, right? So we wanted we wanted to ideally kind of, you know, end up with a new partner where we shared a lot of the same values. And we we're actually really fortunate in that sense because I can roughly map every go nabbit value to living social value, right? But it's easy to map them. It's a bit more difficult to, to live them and take them on, right? Especially if your staff are bought into your Gonabit values in the first place, right? And so I think as much as when we changed platforms, there was a process. So it's kind of like moving your house, right? So you kind of change platforms, you change your back-end systems, your front-end systems, and that can happen fairly quickly. But it's becoming comfortable with those systems as much as, you know, you move your house, your furniture's all there, and you're living there and eating there and sleeping there. But until you've hung all the pictures and fixed the curtains and everything else takes a bit longer, right? As like a second phase. We saw that with platform, but I think we saw that with values as well too, right? And so um, we did a lot of different things where really, uh, you know, experiencing and living those values. And it, it, I have to say, like, you know, it's, uh, it's been a great experience to go through that. Um, it's been a key part of what we've been trying to do as a business. And I think, you know, we're now, what, five months into like a, like a brand transition. I think we're just kind of coming out the other side of that process right now. And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of people that have been around for, since the beginning. A lot of people were there when we created our Going Abbott values, not just they were handed to them on like day one of their employment, right? And so, um, but I'd say they've probably been the most instrumental in helping us like bridge that gap as well too. And I'd say now like, you know, we're about as fully a living social company as we can be right now. And, and it's a good thing. You know, it's uh, Great company culture. They do a great job rolling out the values internationally and really sharing success stories internationally and things too. So I'm really happy with how things have turned out that way. And can you give me an example of a single value, you know, that you're talking about? So like, let's say, for example, um, you know, uh, like a Go Nabbit value, for example. Like we, one of our values was to do things that matter, right? And I can kind of map that into a living social value of make strong moves, right? And, and it's really about being entrepreneurial. It's really about, you know, treating the business as, you know, growing very quickly, about taking risks, about taking calculated risks. And, you know, we use that kind of language all the time, you know, and, and you, know, uh, you know, really in, in, uh, recognizing the activities of staff, even from business, whether we're launching new projects, whether we're, you know, uh, recognizing, you know, uh, great days, you know, sales days on the website or whatever. And really that language around like strong moves, that language around uh, another values like recognize others or champion good ideas. And you can tell that they're values that were developed by a very entrepreneurial business, you know, and they're not so much like the values of a company that's been around for 50 years, you know, in that sense. And so it actually makes it a lot easier to live the values. Like if we'd have been acquired by a company that had been around for 50 years, you know, I think there would have been a much more difficult mapping between values in that sense. Um, and really taking them on far more quickly. Um, I mean, the company, the living social of the company is not that much older than Go Nabbit was as a company, you know? So we were roughly in the same kind of phase, much different scale, obviously, but same kind of like lifetime and life cycle. So I think that helped quite a bit too. But. I see. And as we're talking about values, I'll just mention, you know, someone that I spoke to recently working for a daily deal site said, look, anyone could run this out of their basement if you just take this model and export it. Um, Clearly not everyone is getting acquired by Living Social or expanding at the rate that you guys have expanded. What would you say to that person about what differentiates you guys? Yeah. You know, I think speaking as an entrepreneur, I mean, like, you know, when we first launched, it was about trying to, you know, get a, a large footprint, as large as we could manage as quickly as possible, right? So we launched in Dubai, and then a month later we launched in Abu Dhabi, and then two months later we launched in Lebanon, and then we launched in Egypt and Jordan. And I mean... We looked at, and there's countries that we didn't launch into because we couldn't manage that much more scale, both operationally, but to be honest, financially as well too, right? You have to kind of pick your battles as well. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, yes, there's that point around, you know, people think you can launch the technology very quickly. It's very difficult to get to scale. It's very difficult to get to the scaling point where you have, like people come in our office and they're like, wow, I didn't realize there were so many people. What did all those people do? 
And I'm like, well, look, those people over there, you know, are customer support. They answer the phone, you know, before, during, and after people are buying because people want to feel confidence when they're making transactions online. There's someone there to answer their questions, right? You know, we have a whole team around deal research and scheduling and looking at what we've done that's gone very well, things that haven't gone as well, and everything in between to try to inform us moving forward. So, I mean, we don't start with sales. We start with deal research, essentially, and market research, and then communicate that into sales and move forward. And, I mean, all those people don't fit in your basement, you know, to kind of continue the, I guess, the, you know, the, 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 the phrase of it, you know. But, uh, you know, launching is maybe not that difficult. You know, working with, you know, big name brands and businesses and operating at scale is far, far more difficult um, and probably no easier than any other business, you know, where... Um, and I think that's what really differentiates. There might be a lot of businesses doing what we're doing. There's also a lot of people that are like selling coffee. But how many people operate at scale when it comes to that? How many people are able to support growth and development? How many people are able to hire and retain staff at scale and give them a great, you know, a great career and career development? And how many people are able to, you know, staff customer support, not just during business hours, but in a, that takes staff and money and people, you know, to do that, right? And so I think that's really the scaling issues that are similar with every business. And just because maybe ours isn't, a huge technology business. People see kind of tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes from a systems perspective that people don't see. And I think that's a huge, you probably feel the differences a lot more than you might see them, you know, but you feel them when you call us on the phone, you feel them when you go into a business and they're like, yes, of course, we know what you're talking about. You know, you have your voucher, of course, we know living social, you know, come please sit over here, you know, and whatever. And that's a function of scale and, you know, working with, you know, having the, the team in place to to work with businesses and to work with them on like a, a deep and integrated level and not just, uh, you know, basement business level. Absolutely. And how did you deal with the demand, as you scaled, how did you deal with the demand for cash on delivery services in the region? How did you face that? So, I have a lot to say on this topic, but <laughs> um, when we launched in the UAE, we were a pure credit card business. Pure in the sense that people would come to our office and pay cash, but if you take out that like, you know, 0.1%, we're 100% credit card. And so the reason why we did that, and we didn't expand to other payment methods, and people are like, well, why don't you do cash? You're probably leaving money on the table. And you know what? We did leave money on the table. But what we also wanted to do was, it's kind of like if I offer you one thing to drink, right? I'm only ever gonna know if you will drink that particular thing. And so I offer you, you know, repeatedly and for a long enough time that if you're really thirsty, you're gonna drink it, right? If I offer you multiple things in the beginning, I'm not sure if you didn't drink that one thing because you don't like it or because you saw something else. And it's really that for credit card. There's only really one way we would know if people were willing to use their credit cards online is to only give them one option. And so we also felt like, too, it's far more efficient for us as a business. It's far more efficient for buyers. It's also far more understandable internationally. So when we went off and met with various people internationally about potential acquisition, the fact that you know, all of our numbers were based on credit card transactions is what they're used to. So there was no asterisk beside our numbers, you know, all the time, right? And so we did the same thing, though, in Lebanon. So we launched all credit card in Lebanon. We launched all credit card in Egypt. Over time, we've now expanded that. So we now take cash payments in Egypt. We now take cash payments in Lebanon. But Lebanon, we're still, you know, majority credit card transactions. And that's not easy. I mean, like, you have to have the stomach for it. I mean, there was a lot of people that would come to us and say, you know, I'm trying to buy with my credit card and I can't. And it's because there's nothing to buy online in Lebanon that most banks don't issue the credit cards web-enabled. So people would have to go to their bank, back to their banks and get that done. And so you kind of have to have the perseverance to go through that process, you know. And, and Egypt, we still see 30% credit card probably, you know, which surprises a lot of people. They think it'll be like 2%, you know, or something. I think it's probably because that our early base was built up as credit card purchasers and not, you know, cash purchasers. But... You know, I'm actually more, far more comfortable to add cash as a payment method in our, you know, more mature markets just because we've built up that base of credit card and cash now is now incremental for us as opposed to, I'm just not a believer that like, you know, necessarily just because I'm willing to pay cash, you can migrate me into a credit card, you know, purchaser. I mean, just because I'll climb on an indoor climbing wall doesn't mean I'll ever go climb outdoors. You know, it's two different things, right? I think it's a bit like that with payments, but credit card's far more efficient as a business. It's far more low touch for everybody involved. And uh, I guess it kind of worked. It's easy for me to say because it kind of worked out for us, you know, as a business. But um, I think the ecosystem is very much growing in terms of credit card payments. And I, you know, I'm glad we started the way we did and have grown that way. But. Just finally, uh, according to a recent TechCrunch article, uh, daily deal sites grew 42, by 42% 42 in the last six months of 2011. 
while they fell in North Africa and in North America, sorry, Africa and Asia. Um, what do you think we're going to see in the next year? Do you think they'll continue to come online? When will the market be saturated? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, you know, it depends on the market and the level of maturity in different parts of the world. I mean, we're seeing a bit of consolidation. I mean, uh, you know, just recently there was a company that's kind of through Southern Europe and Latin America that sold all of its Latin American assets to another business in, you know, in Brazil, for example. You've seen some sites in the U.S., you know, close down or kind of have their assets acquired. So not what I would call a uh, positive acquisition, but more a, uh, you know, more of a fire sale type acquisition and things too. But, uh, you know, as much as I hear about businesses starting here in our space, I also kind of hear, you know, people trimming staff or people, you know, exiting markets and things too. So I think, you know, we might see a bit more consolidation and or kind of contraction a bit, you know, as much as we might see new businesses starting. It's still a business where scale is a challenge. It's still a business where operating at scale and operating across markets and becoming profitable, you know, is is still, you know, something that people are working towards now and, and in the near future. And if you're not operating at scale, it's hard to be profitable. And it's hard to get to scale and try to be profitable. So if you're a new entrance, it's really hard to, you know, because speaking as an entrepreneur, I think there's so many great businesses that are yet to be started in the Middle East that I encourage anybody, look, not because I'm in this business, but speaking from an entrepreneur, there's so many great things to go start. If you have the will and the interest and the resources and the time to start a business, start something in a, you know, in an industry that's like, you know, doesn't have a lot of players who are operating at scale. Go into, you know, an industry that has no players, you know, and... <laughs> You know, I think it's it's a far more compelling opportunity as an entrepreneur right now than to be the eleventh, you know, entrant into uh, you know into into any kind of market. You know, and uh, um, people used to ask me about like aggregators. Am I worried about aggregators? I'm like, no. Look, if you have the interest to go out and you know start a business, don't start ag like don't start a secondary business on a year and a half old ecosystem. Go and start something new. We're not our, our industry is not mature enough at all, really, for kind of like ecosystem plays. It's much more of uh, you know, there's a lot, there's so much green field, you know, that, especially in, like, the MENA region, that I think there's fantastic opportunities, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it'd be a shame to start something that, you know, is, is still a young industry, but yet has some players operating at scale. I think there's so many more opportunities to really go into that. Um, um, and I think for us, we're probably going to see, you know, some stability in the market and some maturation but also probably some I think some of the existing players probably moving in some different directions as well too as they look to kind of find different places in that kind of local commerce space you know and I've, you already see it even early in the year this year that people are moving in a bit different directions and expanding in a bit different directions you know off of that core of like group buying you know so it'll be an interesting year it will be uh, thanks for chatting with us yeah,